Okay, so we are continuing, as you can see, in our study through uh, 1 Samuel, and today we find ourselves in chapter 26. And although we're going through this book, we've been going through verse by verse, just want to say that if you've only joined us this week or last week, um, don't think you won't be able to benefit from this study unless you've been here for the previous 25 chapters or that you've got catch-up to do. The study does build upon itself, but there are topical themes and there are very specific applications of each of the individual chapters and the verses that God can and will speak to us through. And the reality is no single verse or passage of God's word that we study is ever going to be time wasted. That being said, if you do want to catch up on any past messages, they're always available on the website. Okay, so this morning, as we look at chapter 26, we're going to see Saul and David crossing each other's paths again one more time. Am I too loud or is it just me sounding boomy? Okay. They're going to cross each other's paths one more time, and in a very similar way to what we saw in chapter 24, we see David presented with yet another opportunity to kill Saul, but again, David instead chooses to spare Saul, and he leaves God to settle the score. And as Jason mentioned last week, it seems a bit strange to compare the attitude David had back in chapter 24, that of sparing Saul, to the very different attitude he had last week in chapter 25 towards Nabal, who he really wanted to kill with his bare hands. Strange because... Though Nabal was a wicked man, he hadn't done as much personal harm to David as Saul had. And then you compare that to what we see in chapter 26, where David spares Saul again and refuses to take the opportunity to kill him when it would have seemed like the logical and even justifiable thing to do. So we're seeing that David was certainly a colorful, a passionate character who lived much in the high highs and the low lows and was rarely seen just existing with the status quo. But it all helps to remind us that David was just a man. A man who had sinful tendencies, a man who had weaknesses, a man who struggled with the desires of his flesh, a man who at times tried to take things into his own hands. Yet in spite of all those things, David was a man who worshipped God. And he desired God's presence and favor in his life. His life was given over to a passionate pursuit of God. And in that pursuit, there were a number of setbacks, failures, weak moments. But he kept getting up again. He kept being a man who was open to receive correction, as we saw last week. And a man who kept being willing to repent when he got it wrong. And change his attitude. And change his actions and conform to God's will and God's ways. And of course, many of these characteristics and some others that we'll see today were the reason that God did describe David as a man after his own heart. And we're going to talk a bit about that today as well. So let's take a look at chapter 26. We're going to discover what God wants to speak to us through this interaction with David and Saul again. And the message is titled, Mercy Triumphs Over Judgment. Let's pray. Father, it is a blessed time every time we come to hear your word because there's treasure there, Lord. And we thank you that as we are expectant that you will speak to us. Help us to see you, Father. Lord, that the whole some reason that we are sitting here today, that we've made the effort to come along and to to do what it takes to get to this place, is that we want to see Jesus. We want to encounter you. We want to worship you. So Lord, may that be true of today, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. So just going to give you an overview of the chapter before we begin. Verses 1 to 4, we see that Saul gets a tip on David's whereabouts and pursues him with 3,000 men. Verses 5 to 7, <clears throat> excuse me, David sends spies to confirm Saul is pursuing him, and then sneaks into Saul's camp unnoticed. Verses 8 to 12, Abishai is rebuked by David for suggesting the killing of Saul, and David spares Saul's life again. Verses 13 to 16, David taunts Abner for his negligence in guarding Saul. Verses 17 to 20, David pleads with Saul to change his ways and let him go free. Verses 21 to 25, Saul gives another insincere declaration of repentance, and David lives another day. So verses 1 to 4. Now the Ziphites came to Saul at Gibeah, saying, Is David not hiding in the hill of Hakila, opposite Jeshimon? Then Saul arose and went down to the wilderness of Ziph, having 3,000 chosen men of Israel with him to seek David in the wilderness of Ziph. And Saul encamped in the hill of Hakila, which is opposite Jeshimon. 
by the road, but David stayed in the wilderness, and he saw that Saul came after him into the wilderness. David therefore sent out spies and understood that Saul had indeed come. So despite Saul seemingly backing down in his pursuit of David in chapter 24, we see in these first few verses of 26, Saul's intentions haven't changed one bit. And as soon as he gets a tip-off in regard to David's whereabouts, he's on the move again, together with 3,000 men determined to find David and destroy him. And that's a good reminder to us right off the bat, that whenever we dedicate ourselves to pursuing God, we can be certain that we'll have enemies pursuing us, whether it's the world the flesh, or the devil. Don't ever be surprised about it. And don't ever think you can seek God without one, two, or all of those enemies seeking you. But just as Paul tells us not to be ignorant of Satan's devices, David certainly wasn't ignorant of Saul's. And that's why David is always one step ahead of Saul. So as David hides in the wilderness, he sees Saul before Saul sees him. He sends some men out as spies. He receives confirmation that, yes, it is Saul, And David knows that Saul is not in his neck of the woods because he wants them to have morning tea together. Verses 5 to 7. So David arose and came to the place where Saul had encamped. And David saw the place where Saul lay, and Abner, the son of Ner, the commander of his army. Now Saul lay within the camp with the people encamped all around him. Then David answered and said to Ahimelech the Hittite and to Abishai the son of Zeruah, brother of Joab, saying, Who will go down with me to Saul in the camp? And Abishai said, I will go down with you. So David and Abishai came to the people by night, and there Saul lay sleeping within the camp with his spear stuck in the ground by his head. And Abner and the people lay all around him. So what appears to be going on here is that David wanders close to where Saul was camped on his own, maybe to confirm it with his own eyes. Then he asks of his men who will join him to go where Saul was camping. And we can never underestimate the emotional burden this would have been for David. A reminder to him again as he looks upon the camp and sees Saul and 3,000 men dedicated to bringing him harm, that his life is in danger. I remember a time as a teenager at school when I stepped in to help someone from a bully because the bully was younger and smaller than I was. But a few days later, I found out that the bully had a big brother who was bigger and older than I was. So for several weeks, I had all of the rough bully types in my town after me, out to get me. I was out shopping with my mum one day, and somebody ran across the road and smacked me on the chin, knocked me on the floor. And I remember how horrible it was for weeks and weeks. Every time I went out in my town, fearing that there were people, who I didn't even know some of them, that were out to get me. I was just a little bit like this all the time. It was, it was horrible. And there weren't even 30 people So when I think of David looking down at 3,000 men dedicated to chasing him down, it had to be very difficult for him. But he was a man of faith. I want us to turn to Psalm 54. I'm not going to put it on the screen. Psalm 54, because David wrote this psalm about this very situation, and it gives us some insight to what's going on in his heart. I so love how we can cross-reference the psalms with David's life, because it's basically like reading his journal. So Psalm 54, if you'll notice, it's titled To the Chief Musician with Stringed Instruments, a contemplation of David when the Ziphites went and said to Saul, is David not hiding with us? And David goes on to say in this psalm, Save me, O God, by your name, and vindicate me by your strength. Hear my prayer, O God. Give ear to the words of my mouth, for strangers have risen up against me and oppressors have sought after my life. They have not set God before them. Selah. Behold, God is my helper. The Lord is with those who uphold my life. He will repay my enemies for their evil. Cut them off in your truth. I will freely sacrifice to you. I will praise your name, O Lord, for it is good. For he has delivered me out of all trouble, and my eye has seen its desire upon my enemies. Such a beautiful pattern for us. Seeing his prayer, this was real stuff. And with so many of David's Psalms, we see how it begins with the raw feelings, with the reality of his situation, showing us the importance of pouring our heart out before the Lord, telling him how we feel, telling him what we fear. But then, as also happens so much in David's Psalms, 
Once the heart has been poured out to the Lord, the Lord strengthens and comforts that heart. And confidence and hope are restored in the Lord. And one of the sometimes less obvious or acknowledged characteristics of David that made him a man after God's own heart was his heart for prayer and for communion and fellowship with God, even as Christ did communion and fellowship with his Father. David took his burdens, his fears, and his concerns to the Lord. And there is nothing stopping us from doing the same. Children, the first point on your sheets this morning is this. When things happen in our lives that make us fearful or sad, we can tell God about it because he wants to help us. When things happen in our lives that make us fearful or sad, we can tell God about it because he wants to help us. And children, it's great for you to get this in your heads when you are very young, that when you feel fearful, when you feel sad, rather than even run and say, Mom, Dad, to say, God, and tell him, help me, God, and he will. When the odds are against us, when our obedience even seems to get us into deeper trouble trouble with the enemy, and when the human perspective is a very troubling one, we too, like David, need to not look out at the trouble before us or look in at the fears within us, but look up to the God who is with us. And I love David's example here of leading from the front in verse 5 also. He goes out first to eye up the situation before asking one of his men to assist him in going back to Saul's camp. And David's fellow man, um, mighty man, Abishai, doesn't need much convincing, does he? He puts his hands straight up for the job and off they go. And they arrive at the camp. They sneak right into where Saul was sleeping. And they see Saul the king lying there asleep with his spear stuck in the ground by his head. And of course, from a human perspective, it seemed like a God-given opportunity to once and for all end the colossal problems David was having with Saul. There he is, vulnerable. Out for the count. And the spear's by his head. And you can imagine this guy, Abishai, certainly as you read, he's he's just chomping at the bit. He's like, verse 8, then Abishai says to David, God has delivered your enemy into your hand this day. Now therefore, please, Let me strike him at once with the spear, right to the earth. I love this. And he says, and I will not have to strike him a second time. (laughs) It won't be a messy job. It's going to go through his head, out the other side, in the earth, and the job's done. But David said to Abishai, do not destroy him. For who can stretch out his hand against the Lord's anointed? I mean, guiltless. David said, furthermore, as the Lord lives, the Lord shall strike him. Or his day shall come to die, or he shall go out to battle and perish. The Lord forbid that I should stretch out my hand against the Lord's anointed. anointed. But please take now the spear and the jug of water that are by his head and let us go. So David took the spear and the jug of water by Saul's head and they got away. And no man saw or knew it or awoke. For they were all asleep because a deep sleep from the Lord had fallen on it. Now verse 12 shows us why David and Abishai were getting away with standing right among 3,000 men without being caught. Not because they were brave and clever, but because God put them all in a deep, supernaturally induced sleep. I can just see the Lord looking down saying, David, my child, go ahead. I'll make sure they don't wake up. I'll keep them asleep. And it's reassuring to know that God is always looking out for his children. And even when we step into the enemy's territory, when we're following his will, he's going to go before us. He's going to protect us. He's going to help us, and we are never on our own. So Abishai in verse 8 there states the obvious, that God has delivered Saul into David's hand. He's more than happy to take care of business on behalf of David. He says, please let me strike him at once with a spear right to the earth, and I'll not have to strike him a second time. But David is not looking at the situation from a human perspective. So he corrects, he rebukes Abishai. Do not destroy him, for who can stretch out his hand against the Lord's anointed and be guiltless? <clears throat> now this may have confused Abishai. After all, was it not David who is now the Lord's anointed king? And was not Saul just getting in the way of that and acting more like the Lord's enemy than the Lord's anointed? 
Abishai knew that David would not kill Saul himself, but he thought he might let him do the job for him. But no, David was not going to authorize the killing of Saul. Even though Saul was 100% committed to hunting down David and killing him, so taking David's or Saul's life could have been seen as the prevention of an assassination attempt on the true king of Israel by the rejected king of Israel. Was it not reasonable to assume that if Saul was allowed to live, David would die? Well, humanly speaking, yes. But in verses 9 and 10 here, David declares two truths that surpass and eclipse the seemingly justifiable execution of Saul. Firstly, that Saul, although a rejected king and although a rebellious king, is still the Lord's anointed. And secondly, that David recognizes it's the Lord's job to take vengeance on Saul, not his. Let's talk about these things a bit more. What does it mean, the phrase, the Lord's anointed? Well, David knew that as a rebellious and wayward man that Saul had become, he was still anointed by the Lord. And therefore, if he was to strike down the Lord's anointed, he'd be guilty of sinning against the Lord. In 1 Samuel 10.1, Saul was officially anointed as king of Israel and then was appointed to that position. In 1 Samuel 16.13, David was anointed as the next king of Israel, but he was not yet appointed into that position. David was officially next in line to the throne, but neither God or Samuel had given David any instruction to usurp Saul's authority in his position as king and take him from his throne by force. That was something that David knew only God could do. <clears throat> and in faith, he was waiting for God's timing, for God's providence, to place him in the position of king for which God had prepared him. He was actually honoring the truth stated in Romans 13, 1, which says, Let every soul be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God, and the authorities that exist are appointed by God. Therefore, whoever resists the authority resists the ordinance of God, and those who resist will bring judgment on themselves. So in sparing Saul's life, David was not saying Saul was right. Okay, He agreed Saul was deep in sin and rebellion, but it was not his place to take the throne by force. David was also living out his life in line with the truths that we read, in Romans 12, verses 17 to 21. Repay no one evil for evil. Have regard for good things in the sight of all men. If it is possible, as much as depends on you, live peaceably with all men. Remember that verse. If it is possible, as much as depends on you, live peaceably with all men. Beloved, do not avenge yourselves, but rather give place to wrath. For it is written, vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. Therefore, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him a drink. For in doing so, you'll heap coals of fire on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. So in all of David's dealings here with Saul, one of his main concerns was, of course, his own safety, which is totally understandable. But as he seeks to ensure his own safety, he's actually far more concerned with his own innocence before the Lord. He knew that if vengeance belonged to God, it didn't belong to him. So he was free to love his enemy and choose not to repay evil with evil. Now this does not undermine or contradict God's command for governing authorities to bring justice to those in society that break the law. That still stands. But it was not within David's jurisdiction, either legally or spiritually, to execute the king at this point in time. So the first truth that David is operating by is that Saul is the Lord's anointed king. He has no place in taking his life or bringing him harm. The second truth that David upholds as being greater than the seemingly justifiable execution of Saul is that David recognizes it's the Lord's job to settle the score with Saul, not his. And you can't help but see in verse 10 that David is speaking with a conviction about this that has been strengthened by his experience with Nabal in the previous chapter that we saw last week. In chapter 25, David was personally offended by Nabal's ingratitude towards the good he did for Nabal. 
David was set on destroying Nabal and his men, but Nabal's wife Abigail courageously appealed to David and God used her actions to make David see the mistake he was going to make. And what stood out to me in that chapter was verse 38, where God strikes Nabal dead. And if you think about all of the effort, the energy, the carnage, and the consequences that would have occurred if David had gone ahead with his own plans, but because of Abigail, he's prevented... And you see in verse 38, in one simple statement, God achieved the exact same outcome that David was seeking to achieve. And it made me think, how many times in my own life are there are things that I take into my own hands? There's a lot of effort, there's a lot of energy, and there's a lot of consequences that occur as a result. Yet if I left it up to God, he could achieve the very same outcome in just one moment. So all that to say... David seems to have really learned that lesson as you hear what he says in verse 10. And this is where we see that growth, that progress in David's life. He says, as the Lord lives, the Lord shall strike him. I've learned this. Or his day shall come to die. I've learned this. Or he shall go out to battle and perish. Whatever way it needs to come about, David says, God will see to it that justice will come to Saul. And I'm going to trust him to do that as and when he sees fit. So clearly David took the higher ground here and the characteristic above all others in David's life here that won the day was mercy. The obvious and deserving act of judgment upon King Saul was eclipsed by an even greater act, the act of mercy. In James 2, 12 to 13, it says, so speak and so do as those who will be judged by the law of liberty. For judgment is without mercy to the one who has shown no mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. As David grew in his faith, he was becoming more and more aware of his own sin. Because of this, and because he was learning to deal with his sin properly, he was also becoming more and more aware of the greatness of God's mercy that had been shown to him. In fact, much later on in life, when he's facing the punishment for his sin of adultery with Bathsheba, he chooses to have God's judgment over man's because even though he knew God was just, he was also infinitely merciful. And so it may just be, and I'm not saying this is a biblical absolute, but it may just be that above all other characteristics in David's life that made him a man after God's own heart, including prayerful fellowship with the Lord, a love for the word of God, a hatred for evil, grief over sin and a desire for God's glory, the one characteristic possibly at the top of the list was simply mercy. As Jonah said, in the midst of all the difficulties, trials, and lessons he was learning, he declared that God was a gracious and merciful God, slow to anger and abundant in loving kindness, one who relents from doing harm. That's our God. That's the God we're here to worship. And by being forgiven of our sins against God, Because of the sacrificial death of Christ upon the cross, God's mercy through Christ has triumphed over the judgment of God that was due to you and to me. God's judgment was still carried out upon Christ when he was crucified, but that allowed the Father to extend forgiveness and mercy towards us, not giving us what we rightly deserved. And that's how we can really define the characteristic of mercy not getting what we deserve. Saul deserved the very thing that David had the ability and opportunity to carry out, but just in the same way David had been shown mercy by the Lord, he too extended mercy to Saul. And as God promised in his word, David's later punishments were measured out with mercy in accordance to the mercy he had shown others. James 2.13, again, for judgment is without mercy to the one who has shown no mercy. And then Matthew 7, 2, For with what judgment you judge, you will be judged, and with the measure you use it, it will be measured back to you. This is a principle of Scripture that we sometimes overlook and we need to pay attention to. It's just there. We will be judged in certain things according to the mercy and the way in which we judge others. David showed mercy because he wanted God's mercy to follow him all the days of his life. Now remember, Saul will still face justice. 
He will still stand before the Lord, but just as Jesus showed Judas great love right till the night he betrayed him, David was free to love Saul, though really he was his enemy. And you and I are free to love our enemies. When we realize that even the sins they commit against us are going to either be washed away by the blood of Christ or be punished on the day of judgment by Christ. Either way, we are free to love because justice will be carried out. But it's not always our job. Children, the second point on your sheets is this. The next time someone hurts you, which will probably happen before you get home today, (laughs) and you want to get them back, remember how much God has forgiven you. And I'll, I'll put a disclaimer on here, children. If you have personally asked God to forgive you for your sins, you know he's forgiven you, you've, you've asked him for forgiveness, then when you want to get back at someone else, just remember that God forgave you. We mustn't understand this. It doesn't mean that we blindly trust, okay? It doesn't mean that we avoid setting boundaries or ignore the biblical principles of rebuke, correction, and discipline. It doesn't mean that if I was in a church in Auckland yesterday and there was a frenzied machete attack from somebody to try and get to my family that I wouldn't do whatever I needed to to disable that person. These are still all biblical things. But it does mean we are free to love. Love is not just letting things go. It's about not taking things quite so personally because after all, if we have enemies... The primary reason should be because of what Christ is doing in us and through us, not because of our own personalities or our prejudices or preferences. I was sharing with Becky a few weeks ago that I was at a funeral last year and some it was said of this person that they died with no enemies. And when I first heard that, I, I felt this feeling like, oh, I don't think I'll be able to say that. Almost like it was a noble thing to aspire to. And then when I got to reflect on it more and more, I thought to myself, you know what? And I, and I shared this with the family. Not, and not to put down this particular person in that context. But for me personally, I said to my children, you know, if daddy dies and he has no enemies, he's done something wrong. Because <laughs> if, if we want to follow Christ with all our heart, soul, mind and strength and pursue Christ and the world hated Christ, they've got to be enemies for the right reasons. But if if I die with no enemies, man, have I messed up my life. Because Christ had enemies. And he was more loving and kind and perfect than I will ever be. So that's why the passage in Romans that we read earlier says, as much as depends upon you, live peaceably with all men. So don't let the reason you have enemies be because of you. Let it be because of Christ in you. So David has the opportunity to kill Saul, but instead... He spares his life, and he takes his spear and his water jug. And these things were a visible declaration of the mercy that David had shown Saul. So as we move on in this chapter, we see the work that God has done in David's heart. We see the way he's freed up to love Saul by the very compassionate way in which he appeals to Saul. Even though before he does that, he does have some fun taunting Abner a little about not protecting the king like he should have done. And I I quite like this section here. This is, this is one I'd love to see in film. So verse 13, Now David went over to the other side and stood at the top of the hill afar off, a great distance being between them. And David called out to the people and to Abner the son of Ner, saying, No, 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 he didn't say that. Do you not answer, Abner? Then Abner answered and said, Who are you calling out to the king? So David said, Abner, are you not a man? And who is like you in Israel? He's kind of puffing him up because he was obviously... A beefy guy who's supposed to look after the king. Why then have you not guarded your lord the king? And you can imagine Abner thinking, well, of course I would guard the lord the king. For one of the people came in to destroy your lord the king. This thing that you've done is not good. As the lord lives, you deserve to die because you've not guarded your master, the lord's anointed. And now see where the king's spear is and jug of water that was by his head. And you can see Abner looking across going, ah, oh, What? But, if the Lord puts you in a deep sleep, what choice have you got? 
They were probably pretty groggy when they woke up. And you can't help but think David found some consolation in doing this, even though there was a sincerity there, because I guess he would have genuinely concerned for Saul's safety. So next, Saul recognizes David's voice and responds to David, and this is where we really get to hear David's genuine, compassionate, and merciful heart towards Saul. Verse 17, then Saul knew David's voice and said, is that your voice, my son David? David said, it is my voice, O Lord, O King. Notice the respectful way he communicates. And he said, why does my Lord thus pursue his servant? For what have I done? Or what evil is in my hand? Now therefore, please let my Lord the King hear the words of his servant. If the Lord has stirred you up against me, let him accept an offering. In other words, if it's the Lord, kill me. But if it's the children of men, may they be cursed before the Lord. For they've driven me out this day from sharing in the inheritance of the Lord, saying, go serve other gods. So now, do not let my blood fall to the earth before the face of the Lord. For the king of Israel has come out to seek a flea, as when one hunts a partridge in the mountains. You hear David's heart there. This is a plea, a desperate cry to a man he really does love, even though he's tried to take his life. And although David is appealing for his safety, he's only appealing for it in the context of what is right in the sight of God. He's not just defending himself. He's pleading for circumstances that will give God the most glory. He's not pleading for circumstances that will give him the most comfort and safety. And he desperately, desperately wanted to be free to be around the people of God again instead of being driven to hide among God's enemies. Saul then responds, but these words are shallow, they're superficial, they're self-focused. Even though to a simple and undiscerning ear, it could sound something like repentance. Verse 21, then Saul said, I have sinned. Return, my son David, for I will harm you no more, because my life was precious in your eyes this day. Indeed, I have played the fool and erred exceedingly. And David answered and said, here is the king's spear. Let one of the young men come over and get it. May the Lord repay every man for his righteousness and his faithfulness. For the Lord delivered you into my hand today. But I would not stretch out my hand against the Lord's anointed. And indeed, as your life was valued much this day in my eyes, so let my life be valued much in the eyes of the Lord. You see, he's making that comparison, the way he can treat Saul because of the way God treats him. And let him deliver me out of all tribulation. Then Saul said to David, May you be blessed, my son David. You shall both do great things and still prevail. So David went on his way and Saul returned to his place. Now we have a few things to talk about. So just because it's the end of the chapter, don't close your Bible and zip it up and put the kettle on yet. Such sincere, genuine, and compassionate words from David, right alongside the deceitful, self-righteous, and calculated words of Saul. Nevertheless, David valued Saul's life. And his motivation for doing that was how much his own sinful and flawed life had been valued by the Lord. Children, the third point in your sheets is this. Even when we're speaking with our enemies, and I don't know how many of you children have got enemies, but even when we're speaking with our enemies, we can be respectful, loving, and merciful, not giving them what they deserve because of God's mercy towards us. They may still be our enemies. They may have done wrong, but we can speak to them respectfully and lovingly. Saul was too far gone completely untrustworthy, unrepentant, a compulsive liar. And we see from the beginning of the next chapter that David sees right through this. And his response immediately is, Saul will not stop till he takes my life. He doesn't say, oh, Saul's sorry at last. I'm free. Saul said the right things, but his heart was not right. He knew that David was the better man, but I don't think he cared anymore. And as it turns out, David never saw Saul from this point ever again. So, it's very insightful to contrast these two men. So some closing thoughts, which is just a preacher's manipulative way of getting you to pay attention because you now see there is an end in sight. <laughs> Let's not forget that God is still seeking men and women after his own heart. And what should encourage us about that, as we've been seeing over and over with David, is that we do not have to be perfect in every way to be a man or a woman after God's own heart. 
clearly as we look at David and what we know of David, yet future, he sinned. He made mistakes, big ones. But in spite of that, he humbled himself, he turned from his sin, and he learned the lessons that he needed to learn. Somebody put it this way, I read this week, and I love this. David had a soul that could be touched by truth. Isn't that awesome? David had a soul that could be touched by truth. And we can never use David's life as an excuse to sin. We don't just sin and compromise and say, well, David sinned and he was a man after God's own heart. That's taking it out of context. But we can have hope when we do sin, knowing that if we deal with it correctly, God is merciful. And then when we experience the mercy of God, we can show that mercy to others, even our enemies. So in light of all of this, who is there in your life right now that if it were up to you, you would quite happily put a spear through the head. <laughs> How's that for an application point? It's the most logical one I could come up with. Well, if there is such a person in your life, hopefully from today's study, you might just be open to the fact that instead of putting a spear through their head, justified as it may seem, enjoyable as it may seem, maybe instead God wants you to respect them, love them, and show mercy to them leaving the justice part up to God. One other thought, and you won't thank me for this one. Also be open to the fact that you might be acting in such a way towards someone that they're wanting to stick a spear in your head. (laughs) Because the fact is, when any of us take our eyes off Christ and give in to our flesh, we can sometimes hinder God's will in the lives of others who are sincerely following God and end up doing more for the enemies of God than for God himself. It happens, but it doesn't need to. Something that one of the speakers said at the conference in the States the other week that really stuck out to me was that so often when we look at a passage of Scripture and there's somebody who makes a stupid decision or or does something stupid, our initial reaction is to say, how could they be so stupid? Rather than, how am I making stupid decisions? It's so easy to look at a passage like this and see ourselves straight away as the victim. We are the victim in the story. And Saul's the enemy. Do we sometimes think maybe we're being the Saul? And like this person said that made the point very clearly. We look out, we make judgments. Just like the person sitting in traffic complaining about the stupid traffic that's hindering them and the enemies around them when they need to understand that you're not stuck in traffic, you are traffic. And we don't always think about it that way. So there is a time and a place for justice. There is a time and a place for correction and rebuke. But there are many situations in our lives where because of the mercy God has shown us, we too can show mercy as we let mercy triumph over judgment. As we think about these things, let's let's make it even more personal to our church. This morning I was just praying, not as long as I wanted to, just say that, because when you say praying, you think, oh yes, you know, hours and hours of prayer, not at all. In fact, I was trying to, to block out the, you know, nice normal home sounds at home, and so I put some little earphones in, and I was flicking through on my uh, iPad, and I put these nature sounds on, it was like a beach, it was, it was probably some new age meditation thing or something, but... It was, all it was was sounds of the, of the sea going, shh, and birds, you know, and it worked perfectly. It was great. So I plugged in, and there's, you know, the normal house sound, kids getting ready, and here was I on the beach. But I was praying. I was praying about the message. I was praying for our response to the message, and I was praying about these things. And as I'm praying, I'm th- I was saying to the Lord, though this is a pleasant sound, my mindset is not oh, the beach and relax and chill out, because that's, that's not my heart. These are serious things. I want us to be pressing into the Lord. And as I was thinking these things, the Lord just gave me this picture that just really spoke to me. And I think it spoke to me about, you know, something that potentially is a, is a threat to us here in this fellowship or something that could be happening. And it was this. You've got the sounds of the waves. You've got the sounds of the birds. And you, straight away, you could put yourself on a deck chair, pina colada, sun just, you know, you're there. But then what hit me, I think the Lord did this, was those exact same sounds could be occurring 
And as you look out, you see mines, dead soldiers floating in the water, dead bodies over here, and it's deathly silent. And I saw exactly the same, or heard exactly the same sounds, but with different images. And that made me think about our lives as Christians. And in, in that picture, I also saw men who had seen what had happened by the enemy, and they were hiding behind rocks. And they were sh- shivering, and they were scared to come out, and no one was coming out to engage the enemy. And it made me think, is that what Satan wants to do sometimes with us? And as a fellowship, could it be that sometimes we want beach more than beachhead, maybe? And as we see what the enemy does in people's lives, we can sometimes be hiding behind the rocks and scared. We don't want to press forward into the enemy territory. But that doesn't mean pressing forward aggressively, because as we think about David in this chapter, what was he doing? He was pressing forward into the very territory of the enemy with what? Acts of mercy. Obedience to the word of God. And he was taking ground, not in the way that we might think militarily, but he was making progress. So my exhortation to you in that, because I really felt that the Lord just gave me that to share, was that let's be aware of that. Let's not be ignorant of Satan's devices. And as a fellowship, let's not have beach. Let's have beach head. And let's come out from behind those rocks and keep pressing forward because God has already won the victory. And we can be merciful even to our enemies. And we can see him glorified. Amen.